Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see all of you this morning, and you made it through the chaos that is market days and the race right outside our door. So we get all kinds of background music, let's say, <laughs> as we uh, go, go through our service this morning. So we begin on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to us all on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, that mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Here with the Spirit is saying to God's people. Our psalm today is Psalm 16, found on page 599 in the Book of Common Prayer. We will read this responsibly, breaking at the asterisk. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land. But those who run after other gods, their libations of blood I will not offer. O oh Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who are all my God. Find boundaries and close a pleasant land. Indeed, I will 
bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I have set the Lord always before me. My heart therefore is glad and my spirit rejoices. For you will not abandon me to the grave. You will show me the path of life. reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. to Jerusalem. And he sent messages ahead of him, 
On their way, they entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. From the very beginning of his ministry on earth, Jesus knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen to him when he got there. And he knew that there was no possibility of avoiding it. So you might have thought that the closer he got to Jerusalem, the more imminent his destination, the more imminent his arrest, the more imminent his execution, the more agitated he would become. You might think that with every step closer to his crucifixion, Jesus' feet would drag just a little more. But that's not at all what we read in this passage from Luke's Gospel. Far from avoiding Jerusalem, Jesus becomes even more deeply resolved to go there and face what's in store for him as, as the time of his persecution and his death approaches. He sets his face towards Jerusalem and he doesn't allow anything to divert him. The Samaritan village that Jesus and his disciples passed through, that could have been a diversion because of the enmity that existed between Jews and Samaritans. It was common practice for Jewish travelers to make massive detours around the Samaritan territory simply to avoid any confrontations. Again, you might have thought that Jesus would choose to take that circuitous route, if only to delay his arrival in Jerusalem. But he does no such thing. And when both his advance messengers and his traveling party are snubbed by the Samaritans, Jesus refuses to retaliate. James and John want to call on the power of God to punish their enemies, but Jesus won't hear of it. He rebukes his friends and he moves them on to another more hospitable village. Now, although Jesus' behavior may appear unusual to us, I'm afraid James and John's behavior is all too familiar. We live in a vengeful society, one with daily incidents of road rage, domestic violence, and litigation. We are committed 
to looking after one, number one, payback and punishment are common practice. Well, the world hasn't changed much over the centuries. That's the kind of society that Jesus and his disciples lived in too, as they make their way to Jerusalem, where Jesus will face the ultimate punishment. But as we've seen, Jesus doesn't allow his approaching arrest or his treatment by the Samaritans or his disciples' behavior to divert him from the path that's been laid out by his Father. At no point in his ministry has Jesus ever bought in to the corrupt values <clears throat> of the world, including the desire for self-preservation and the preoccupation with revenge. And he's not going to start now. In fact, Jesus uses the journey to Jerusalem as an opportunity to teach a lesson, a lesson in priorities. Shortly after they move on from the Samaritan village, one of Jesus' followers makes a pledge of absolute loyalty to him. And Jesus reminds the man that there are no earthly benefits to making a commitment like that. The world looks for the material rewards that can come from associating with a celebrity. But Jesus makes it clear that even he doesn't have a home of his own. The benefits of following him are entirely spiritual, and that makes them more precious than any form of worldly wealth. Jesus also explains that the decision to follow him comes with costs. Luke shares two examples in his gospel of men who want to delay their commitment to Christ while they deal with family matters. Although it's clear throughout the Gospels that Jesus both honors and encourages responsibility to family, he also calls us to take an honest look at our motives when we use that responsibility as an excuse. Just as it was for Jesus himself, whose face was set towards Jerusalem, despite the obstacles and the terrors that awaited him there, there's no looking back when we choose to embrace the Christian life. There are real sacrifices to be made including letting go of behaviors and priorities and values that are so much a part of the world we live in. In the time of Moses, God's people were in desperate need of holy laws that regulated every aspect of their lives. But there's plenty of evidence throughout scripture of how those laws were either abused or taken so literally that they did more harm than good. Jesus devoted his entire ministry to teaching God's people to internalize the one commandment that encompasses everything that God requires of us. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In his letter, to the church in Galatia, Paul describes that commandment as a way Christians can live into the freedom Christ has won for them. And he warns the Galatians to avoid any influences that can prevent them from doing so. He calls those influences desires of the flesh. And he makes it clear that they are in total opposition to the leading of the Spirit. Paul urges the Galatian Christians to live by standards that are different from those of the rest of the world. He implores them not to give in to the allure of the spirit of the age, 
which isn't all that different from the spirit of the age we live in now. And it's the same one that Jesus' disciples struggled with on the road to Jerusalem. For thousands of years, human behavior has been dominated by the works of the flesh that Paul lists in his letter. Incidents of greed and materialism and sexual immorality and intolerance and uncontrolled anger and hostility, impiety, excessiveness, infidelity, violence, self-indulgence. These are the things that we read about daily or see on our television news or on the internet. And they're things that we've all experienced in one form or another in ourselves. But Jesus shows his followers that it's possible to live differently, to set one's face towards Jerusalem and not be distracted or influenced by anything else. And Paul's letter helps the young church of Galatia to understand what that means. When we set our face towards Jerusalem, we are choosing the way of the cross. We're choosing to crucify that part of us that's governed by uncontrolled passions and desires. And we're choosing instead to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruits of the Spirit work together to restore and build up human relationships. They enable us to express love for one another, both neighbor and enemy rather than constantly putting ourselves first. The laws of Moses were needed to provide the people of God with a blueprint for living a holy life, but the Spirit creates a longing in us to live that way. And the people around us notice the difference. The Right Reverend Tom Wright, who's one of the foremost New Testament scholars of our time, wrote this. We of all people should know that we are called to live by a different spirit. We have been seduced by the easy lie that we must be like the world in order to be relevant. Actually, the world desperately needs people who are different, who keep their integrity, their promises, their cool, who quietly demonstrate that there is a different way of being human, and that it makes you and those around you more human, not less. You know that a huge variety of expectations exist in people who have limited or non-existent experience of people of faith, depending on what news report they've been watching or how they've been influenced by social media claims. They may be under the impression that churchgoers are anti-gay, or excessively tolerant, or pro-life, or pro-choice, or ultra-liberal, or ultra-conservative, or just plain nutty. In other words, Christians of all denominations are often judged on the basis of irrational thinking and misguided extremes. But there's another type of preconception, one that our bishop often talks about. 
Bishop Rob maintains that when people come to church, especially when they come for the first time, they expect to experience holiness. He isn't talking about a nebulous atmosphere of holiness. He means holiness that is personified in the people of God who make up our congregations. Personal holiness, Bishop Rob says, is the reality that we need to claim and reclaim in the context of a loving, holy God. The people that we invite to come and see our parish, to experience our fellowship, the people we serve in our outreach center, the people we meet in our daily lives and work, they expect to see something different about us. In fact, they long to see something different about us, to know that it's real, and to find out that they can have it for themselves. Because God's Holy Spirit never stops reminding us that there is a better way. Amen. Prayers of the People are Form 6, found on page 392 in your Books of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and 
and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the greatest of this hunger, fear, and justice. We pray for all members of our community who have been made to believe that they are not welcome in church buildings and communities, especially those who have been excluded because of how their minds were created to function. We pray that we, the people who are the church, will share with all adults and children who are autistic or otherwise neurodiverse that they are not only welcome here, but are wanted here just as they are and that we celebrate them as beloved children of God. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the Lord's ministry of the sick, and needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, Pray for the province of the Episcopal Church of Sudan. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the seasonal chapels of St. Andrews by the Sea in Rye Beach and St. James Church, Birkenhaven in Sunapee. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Rob, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray today for Gail, Alice, Amy, Caroline, Charlie, John, Charlotte, Anne, Nick, Betty, Essie, Carol, Kathy, Charlie, Tama, Mary, Bob. Hear us, Lord. As we pray through our parish list, we lift up the following people to you, giving thanks for each of them and asking for your blessing on their lives. Jean, Marie, and Pat Chalou, Gail Church, Rebecca, Claire, Fran Clapp, Faith Clark, Tim Klein and Sean Runyon, Charles Clough, Caddy Clow, Jean Coburn, Barbara Collins. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, remembering especially today Fran Bronson. Philip Goldsmith, and Greg Skinny, and those whose memory an altar flower gift has been given, Douglas T. Jackson. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In the
Well, thank you all for your flexibility as we gather for our first summer worship service. You'll see in your Friday update that we are alternating uh, uh, service formats. So today there is no congregational singing. Next Sunday there will be, and so it goes on alternating Sunday by Sunday. Our 4.30 service on Saturday was well attended yesterday, and I just want to remind you that that will be taking place throughout the summer. 4.30, no music at all, uh, just a quiet contemplative service that frees you up for your Saturday evening afterwards. I've had a couple of comments recently that you're finding, or some of you are finding it hard to hear me, so if that applies to you, could you please put your hand up? All right, because we want to make sure that there's not a dead zone. We have had a few problems with microphones and speakers, um, but we, we continue to make sure that everything's functioning. Okay. Wait, well, except that that's what I thought too, but um, then they said it happened when I was in the pulpit as well. So we just want to be sure. Um, yes, Judy has mentioned no masks. It's much clearer. It is, okay. I think it's because we've been tweaking. Well, our wonderful um, McGonaghy's have been tweaking. Thank you very much, Larry and Heather. Okay. Pardon? Good thing I read it Yes, so several people are reminding us from the keys we have moved to optional masks. And again, uh, please respect those who continue to wear them. There's absolutely no problem with wearing a mask and uh, continue to distance as much as you can. We will um, have communion continuing in one kind only, um, but that too may change in the near future. But uh, thank you all again for your flexibility. Speaking of that communion, I will be putting on a mask when we are distributing, so if you feel more comfortable receiving from someone who is wearing a mask, I will put a mask on and that will be an option. Thank you, Peggy. The uh, day before yesterday was a momentous day, the Episcopal Church in general, and even our parish uh, have differing views on Roe versus Wade. Our bishop has written a wonderful letter addressing the subject. It doesn't come down one way or the other, it just encourages gentleness and mutual respect during a time that is, is very danger, in very much in danger of becoming yet another division in our country. So there are copies of that letter on the vestry information table where Tamer sits after the service. Uh, and I encourage you to read that. We'll probably be putting a link to it as well on our website or in our Friday update. Meet the Gospel happens today at coffee hour. There's a table set aside with a little tent on it that says Meet the Gospel. And all that means is that you take your service sheet with you and have an informal chat about things that have uh, just come to your mind through hearing or reading our today's gospel passage. And uh, next Sunday, we are hoping to start having an outdoor element to our coffee hour, but we do need people who are willing to help move tables, chairs, coffee urns, that sort of thing. So if that is something you would be willing to do um, for our nine o'clock coffee, or 10 o'clock coffee hour, please have a word with me after the service. And softball is happening again. We started uh, last, last Monday uh, at Bug Field. Uh, our team did not win, which is how they play. And <laughs> <laughs> but they always enjoy anyone who would like to join them or root for them, cheer them on. It's, you know, it's more fun than anything else. And tomorrow's game will be uh, against Center Point Church and Center Point Field. Detail, details again in your Friday update. And I'm only younger. Uh, you have to be at least 15. <laughs> so you're okay, Bob. Uh, before I hand over to Peggy for her announcements, I would just like to announce that today is Peggy's fourth anniversary of her priestly ordination. Our regrets. And it is also on Wednesday, Kate's 25th anniversary of her priestly 
ordination. Wow. <laughs> yes, the uh, diocese is having a wonderful outdoor event at Oriorn State Park on the 16th of July. It is going to be a wonderful time with outdoor worship and tide pooling and activities and good fellowship. And if you are interested in coming and spending that time with others from around the diocese, please sign up. It is free, but they do need to know how many people are planning to attend. If you have grandkids, nieces or nephews who might be interested, please bring them. If you have kids who are not currently here, bring them. It will be a wonderful time of, like I said, fellowship, meeting people from other places in the diocese, and spending a wonderful time on the coast. So, and not, and not just kids. Nope, all are welcome. So guess what all of your kids want? <laughs> Some are still so kids. <laughs> you got them right there. Bob, you're still a kid. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so it's going to be fun. Um, please consider signing up. And if you can, pass it on to someone who might not, not have heard the announcement so that they can sign up. And let your light so shine before all people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven.
We turn to page 361 for Eucharistic Prayer A. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! Some members of our congregation are joining us from afar, 
and are so unable to partake of our Holy Eucharist with us. So I invite those of you who are joining us remotely to join me in this prayer. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Amen. The holy gifts of God for the holy people of God and everyone is welcome at God's table. Amen.
Turning to page 165, sorry, 365, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.